Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Self Helpless. I'm Kelsey Cook. I'm Delaney Fisher. And we have back on one of our favorite guests, Dr. Stephanie Sarkis. She came on. She's so good. She came on um, and did our gaslighting episode that came out a couple months ago. And we got such great feedback about that episode. And uh, you guys wanted more of her and we wanted more of her. Yes. Not only is she an expert in gaslighting, but she's also an expert in adult ADHD. So, and just as a refresher for you guys of Dr. Sarkis's background, she's a psychotherapist. She's an author, um, American Mental Health Counselors Association diplomat, and she specializes in child and adolescent mental health counseling. So she's just the best. She talked so in depth about adult ADHD and the misconceptions and the symptoms and the treatment. and how it I, even coincides yeah. with gaslighting was yes. so surprising. Yeah. And the fact that she she talked about how she also has ADHD, which I don't think I knew that um, during our first episode with her. No, I didn't either. Yeah. yeah. So that was interesting too. So it's a really unique perspective because it's somebody who has it who also is a clinician and, yeah. and helps treat people for it. So um before we get into our interview with Dr. Sarkis, just a reminder, you guys know I'm still on tour. Uh, this is coming out at the end of September. So this coming weekend, DC Helpsters, I'm so excited to finally see you. September 30th through October 2nd, I'm at the DC Comedy Loft. So this weekend, you can get tickets at KelseyCook.com. And then um, October 13th through the 16th, I know we've got some San Francisco Bay Area Helpsters as well. I'm at the San Francisco Punchline those nights. <clears throat> and then if you can go to uh, KelseyCook.com for the rest of my tour dates, there's a bunch through the rest of the year and next year as well. Yay. Awesome. And you can head over to DelaneyFisher.com for information about my business coaching and to find Efficionado, the podcast, which is a business podcast for service providers who are looking for more unconventional methods when it comes to simplifying and streamlining and scaling their business. And I offer at this point, I offer one comped call uh, per week to a service provider who is interested in getting help with one area of their business. So if there's one thing that's really bugging the shit out of you, sign up for a call and we will solve it on that call. Yup. Um, without further ado, here is our interview with Dr. Sarkis. Dr. Sarkis, thank you so much for being here again. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on the show. Yes, you absolutely <laughs> crushed the episode you did on gaslighting. We loved it. Our community loved it. And we had to have you back to talk about your other area of expertise, ADHD. Yes. This is I am happy to share time. whatever my knowledge is with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the very first time we're talking about this. It is uh, highly requested from our listeners, actually, for the past several years, and we're finally able to get around to this topic. So if you can just start off with giving us an overview on what is ADHD, how is it different to ADD, all the good mm-hmm. basics. Well, first, ADHD and ADD is all pretty much ADHD. So sometimes you may hear I have ADD with the H or without the H, but clinically we refer to it all as ADHD. And there's three different types. There's the inattentive type, which is the kind of looking out the window, difficulty paying attention to details, difficulty following through on tasks. Then there's the hyperactive impulsive type, which are things like feeling an inner sense of restlessness, interrupting people saying stuff and then going, ooh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. And then there's the combined type where you meet criteria for both the inattentive and the hyperactive impulsive type. And this is a disability that impacts all areas of life. So it's not just something that happens at work or at home. This impacts how you are with friends, how you interact with the community. It can cause a lot of issues such as increased rates of depression, anxiety, and also suicidality too. Oh, wow. Wow. Can you say specifically what those letters stand for in ADD versus ADHD? Sure. Sure. Yeah. I just realized I didn't do that. (laughs) It's It's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Okay. Gotcha. Or attention deficit disorder or is it? And that's the, that's the thing where we kind of refer to everything as ADHD now. Okay. Okay. So So that's like a new, 
that's kind of a new development in this space um, or has I it think just been that, a I think misconception? For the general public, it's ADD or ADHD, but the clinical term is actually ADHD. So I think we're moving more towards um, oh, AD yeah. in the public. ADHD in attentive type is what we used to refer to as ADD. Oh, that's so interesting. Even, even if you just have the inattentive type, you can still have issues with some hyperactivity impulsivity. Okay. So like when you're a kid, you may be running around a lot, but you know, in a staff meeting, you're kind of swiveling in your chair or you're playing Candy Crush on your phone or you're you're doing anything but being able to focus because ADHD isn't really a problem with attention. It's a problem with motivation. You can't get your brain motivated to do the things it needs to do and you can't tear yourself away from things that really interest you because you can hyper-focus with ADHD too. Like your attention can be laser sharp if it's something you really want to do. Mm-hmm. Almost to the point where someone's calling your name, you don't even hear them. So the goal is to get your brain into more of a space where you can switch tasks pretty easily. And also you're able to process information and understand what someone said the first time they said it. Because when you have ADHD, you have dysfunction in the frontal lobes of your brain. So this area right here. So I don't if people are just listening, they can't see what I pointed to, but I pointed to the, <laughs> the front yeah. of my head. Um, yeah. And uh, in your, your prefrontal cortex and your frontal lobes, there are things called executive functions. And those do things similar to what an executive does to company. They take in information, they process it, they figure out where that information needs to go, they store it, and that's impaired in ADHD. So with ADHD, you don't just have issues of paying attention to details and difficulty following through. You also have issues with time estimation, with regulation of emotions. You tend to get more frustrated. And it's hard to talk yourself back down to what I call baseline. Uh, you also have issues with, uh, with delayed gratification. So if I say to you, I'll give you $10 now or $20, if you wait a few hours, people with ADHD that aren't being treated for ADHD, we're more likely to just take the money, you know, the $10 and not wait the extra amount of time. Um, and there's also an issue of uh, increased rate of credit card debt, increased rate of home foreclosures, and you have ADHD because of difficulties with managing money. So and there's also a whole host of other issues that go along with ADHD as well. Wow. It's so <laughs> I have one so thing, many questions. <laughs> one, I have so many questions too. One thing that you said though, where you said about the hyper focus, where you can you can get really focused. And I feel like the the reputation of ADHD is that you have a hard time focusing on anything, but you're saying actually the focus can be so deep and you can have so much attention to something that you kind of drown everything else around you. That is a fast, right. like that's a misconception a lot of people might have. Right. Because sometimes people say to me, well, I don't know if I have ADHD because sometimes, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing gaming or if I'm, I'm on my phone that, you know, time can pass. It doesn't even seem like, like anything has really happened. You know, it's like five hours later and I'm still here. That's actually a sign of ADHD is having the hyper-focus. So wow. if you think of it that way, that again, it's not a problem with attention. It's more like it should be called motivation regulation disorder. Again, you can't tear yourself away from things that are really interesting to your brain and you can't get yourself moving on things that you have to do, but you don't really want to do. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> that so many explosions happening in our heads. I know. <laughs> um, is this something that people are born with or that they develop over time? Um, can there be genetic predispositions to it? Well, the diagnostic criteria says you have to have symptoms that are present before the age of 12. And I find that a lot of adults have a hard time remembering their childhood symptoms because, you know, there's so much stuff going on in life. It's hard to remember, you know, what your, you know, sixth grade birthday party was like, or, you know, what, (laughs) or how you were conversationally. Yeah. Right. Like your day to day. Right. Right. So there's a study that found that if you ask people their symptoms prior to the age of of 12, only about 40% can recall them. If you ask them their symptoms prior to the age of 16, about 90% of them can recall them. So part of it is is that if you have report cards from when you were younger, if if you still have held on to those, or if you have any kind of paperwork from when you were a kid, look for things on those that say things like doesn't work to potential, difficulty staying in seat, bothers your neighbors in class, uh, doesn't complete assignments, completes assignments, doesn't turn them in. Those are some of the hallmark signs you see on report cards and also behavior reports in school. You also may have found that if you're female with ADHD, you tended to be quiet or kind of sat in the back of the class or you were, or you didn't raise your hand uh, because when there's this gender difference in ADHD that when you're a boy with ADHD, society-wise, you know, if you speak out in class, you're being a class clown, boys tend to get reinforced for that. And it's also... 
uh, brought to the teacher's attention that, hey, this kid may have some behavior issues. With girls, if they speak out in class, their peer group tells them very quickly, we don't do that. So if you're a girl with ADHD, you're, you tend to kind of fall through the cracks and maybe not get noticed that you have ADHD until you get older. So for some women, they don't get diagnosed or realize that there's an issue until they go to college because you've had all the structure all the way from elementary through high school. Then you get to college and you're left to your own devices to study and to get to class on time. You know, nobody's telling you to go to class. So that's where a lot of women with ADHD oh. kind of hit the wall and they realize that, that something's not working the way it should. Uh, and there's this real kind of loss potentiality, meaning that what you should be able to do and what your brain can do are two different things. But luckily, there are a lot of treatments available. So you mentioned like in the school setting, the kids are usually or the kids or young adults are having a hard time with it with homework, assignments, all that stuff. Is it ever a different situation where somebody with ADHD is a really like it's a straight A student because their hyper focus mm-hmm. is school and getting a certain grades and all that? Yeah, the interesting thing about ADHD is that sometimes you can have perfectionism. So you will kind of swing the other way. So basically, if you have an issue with ADHD, the research says if you have a higher IQ, you're able to compensate better. So you're able to come up with techniques to kind of mitigate or squish down the ADHD symptoms. So you may become a perfectionist because you realize you tend to be disorganized and you need to have a completely clean desk to work or you need to make sure that your papers look good in order for you to be able to turn them in. And it can go kind of overboard into anxiety producing perfectionism. So when you have ADHD, you tend to overcompensate. You don't just compensate a little bit, you overdo it. Or if you're, you tend to run late to something, now you show up an hour early, which is also not a good use of your time. So you see that people can have these different kind of flavors of ADHD where you have different symptoms because there's nine symptoms for the inattentive type and nine for the hyperactive impulsive type. You need to have uh, at least six out of nine of those symptoms. So you can have different clusters of symptoms. I mean, the saying is once you've seen someone with ADHD, you've seen someone with ADHD because there's not a unifying thing. I mean, there's a unified set of symptoms, but we can each express it a little bit differently. So some people, yes, yeah, some people do appear to be organized as a compensation for being disorganized. And there's also other personality characteristics we have too. I mean, we're not just ADHD. ADHD is part of what's going on, but you may have also other tendencies too, but it is highly genetic. So if you have ADHD, there's a 75% chance that one of your parents has the genes for it as well. And then maybe those people weren't diagnosed. It may have been like you kind of suspect. So what I ask people, right. is anybody in your family been diagnosed with ADHD or who do you think might have it? And usually a parent or a grandparent has some signs of you not working to potential, being underemployed, meaning that this is a very smart person, but they uh, had a hard time graduating from college or high school, or they're working in a field that if they were able to harness that, um, that ability to process information and to pay attention and to be motivated, that they could have achieved so much more in life. And again, that leads into the anxiety and depression and people with ADHD have a six times higher rate of substance abuse. Because if you're missing brain chemicals, you're going to find a way to replace them, whether you realize it or not, whether that's through, you know, FDA approved medication or you're doing high risk stuff like people with ADHD tend to you know, start using substances at an earlier age and they use them more, tend to engage in more high risk sexual activity. They tend to have a high rate of STDs. They tend to have a higher rate, again, like we talked about, of suicidality, depression, anxiety. So you know, there's a lot of talk about, well, there's these gifts of ADHD, but, it's, but it also is a disability that can cause some, some difficult, you know, quality of life issues for people. Yeah. Can you go over the specific symptoms of each? Sure. Sure. So with the inattentive type, you have difficulties uh, paying attention where attention is required. So like in class, you also have difficulties with uh, following through on instructions. So multi-step instructions can be pretty difficult for you. So if they aren't written down and someone gives you like three steps, you remember the first one and then you come back, you're like, okay, I totally did that. And they're like, no, you only did like the first one. And you're like, well, what other ones were there? You know, like you get the first one, you don't remember the others. Uh, Also a difficulty with organization. So you clean your house because it reaches this point where you can't see the floor and that's like your limit, right? So you clean, 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 and it stays clean for like a few hours and then it gets messy again. Also losing items you need. So let's say you need your jacket because it's a little cooler outside, but you can't find it or you leave it at work or you leave it at school. or you. you so it's items that you need for things like just basic day-to-day living. Uh, also for a lot of people, it's I complete the assignment, but I forgot to turn it in. 
because the ADHD brain, it's like, once you finish the assignment, you're done. So we don't think about those extra steps of, oh, wait a second, I have to actually turn it in somewhere. So you see a lot of that, which is incredibly frustrating for people with ADHD because you did the assignment, but now you're not getting credit because you just didn't turn it in. Wow. Oh my goodness. So also uh, the, the, those are just some of the inattentive type symptoms. The hyperactive impulsive type are things like difficulty waiting turns or being in traffic. So I know, you know, you're by the 405, right? So for people with ADHD, they will do whatever it takes to avoid traffic. Like they will go out of their way, even add on hours onto their drive time to avoid being stuck in traffic. So also waiting in line, like at the grocery store, you know, they're like hedging their bets. They're going from one you know, lane to the other, <laughs> trying to see which one they'll you know, go to first, you know, which lane is shorter, uh, because waiting in line is something that's just really not very tolerable. So also inner restlessness. So again, when you're a kid, you tend to have that hyperactivity piece. But when you get older, it's just this itching to move. You can't just sit there. You're, you're wobbling around your chair. You're clicking your pen. Um, for a lot of people, I recommend they sit on you know, a Pilates ball, the big exercise ball while they're working, because when you stimulate their, your cerebellum, which is the movement part of your brain, you're better able to focus with the frontal lobes. So if you keep moving, you're better able to pay attention. So, uh, so difficulty with staying still, uh, difficulty with interrupting, uh, difficulty with uh, blurting out answers to questions where they've been completed. So you're talking to your friend, your friend's kind of going on with their story and you're like, uh, yeah, I'll, like cut to the chase. Let's get to the meat of what you're trying to tell me. Right. So talking around circles, you're like, no, tell me the thing that you want to tell me. Uh, or it's also when the teacher is asking a question or your boss is asking you a question, you're like, I already know what they're going to ask me. So I'm just going to answer it. So you have a hard time holding a thought in your mind. So you're like, okay, I got to tell you this thing right now, because if I don't tell you now, it's going to leave. Uh, and if you don't have treatment-free ADHD, those thoughts, if you don't say them right then, they're going to go and never come back. So there's this pressure to, I have to say this right now, regardless of what you're talking about. You're talking about squirrels, but I just want to tell you about Sweden. So I like have to tell you this right now, even though it like, doesn't fit. So it's changing topics and conversation really quickly. So, and also just an overall feeling of being driven by a motor, being on the go. It's kind of like just this internal itch to move. So yeah. sometimes when people are sitting still or like they're, they're at a movie, they'll like start talking during the movie or they'll, you know, be doing something else. Or I tell people, you know, if you're sitting somewhere like watching TV with your family or friends, you know, just have something to do with your hands. Like some people have started doing knitting or crochet or other things they can do to keep their hands busy. Otherwise they'll pick at their hands or pick at their hair. Cause sometimes people with ADHD will start getting trichotillomania or dermatillomania, which is pulling at your hair, picking at your skin. So keeping your hands busy is really important. Can we talk about the phone component of ADHD mm -hmm. and how, cause you're saying that it's, it is genetic that people are born with it. So they, they can't develop it later. There are some ADHD-like syndromes. So if you have damage to your frontal lobe of your brain or what, we, what we've seen in uh, like retired NFL players, they have cr uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, where it's, uh, there's repetitive concussions and damage to the frontal lobe. You can see an ADHD-like syndrome. But the criteria for diagnosis is you've had symptoms prior to the age of 12. So uh, there are cases where sometimes people, again, don't remember that. Um, there's also a higher rate of being a victim of abuse or survivor of abuse if you have ADHD. ADHD. So sometimes our brains kind of block out that stuff. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you see people that, yes, they clearly did have symptoms before the age of 12. Um, it may be difficult to say what those are, but you know that that was probably present. So uh, there are people that, that seem to not have symptoms, but once you start digging, there usually is some evidence of symptoms prior to the age of 12. Uh, but yeah, there are some people that can have frontal lobe injury and it can look a lot like ADHD. Okay. So th the reason I was asking about that is because now with smartphones, there's mm -hmm. that people throw that around really casually like, oh God, now I have such ADD because of my phone and phones are making everybody have ADD. How do you feel about that? Do you feel that that has worsened people's ability to just sit and like watch a movie without checking their phone once? I mean, how, how have you seen that happen? Well, if you look at it as you know, we use terms like I'm so anxious or I'm so obsessed with this or I'm depressed, it may not mean that you meet clinical criteria. So when you have something like you're hyper focusing on your phone, well, does this 
translate into other areas of your life? Are you having difficulties with meeting deadlines at work? Are you difficulty? Are you having difficulty with following multi-step processes? Are your friends getting upset because you tend to interrupt them? So this is a global disorder, meaning it impacts all areas of life. So if you lose your keys once in a while, it's probably not ADHD. But if you're doing it to the point where you're you're late to work, you are uh, leaving items at work that you have to drive back home to go get them. Um, you are having difficulties again with relationships, friendships, work, school, then you probably have a disorder. So the issue with phones is that everyone is attracted to their phone because it's colors that don't exist in nature. It's constant movement. Um, you know, their algorithms are designed to make us focus, focus, focus on what we're watching, right? So I mean, I, look, I was on YouTube and I think they, they suggested a video to me of water to- towers falling, like, you know, like the big water towers. And I'm like, yeah. why... I nothing I watch is anything to do with what I watched the entire 12 minute video. And I was like, this is the most amazing thing ever. And it's water <laughs> towers falling. So, you know, this algorithm is really smart, right? Like it yeah, knows right. what you like. So for anybody without ADHD, it's really easy to get sucked into that, that hole, that black hole of, of watching stuff. Yeah. When you have ADHD, that is like times a thousand. So you're already sucked into the phone or gaming because, you know, like if you think of gaming, it's constant movement, it's going up through levels, it's earning things, so it's positive reinforcement. So it's all the things the ADHD brain likes. So for someone with ADHD, looking at their phone is much more of a draw than for other people. But other people may find that without ADHD, that they're like, oh, you know, I'm getting more distracted. But for people with ADHD, it can it can take so much time out of your day and can mm-hmm. really impact your quality of life. So a lot of it is what's the intensity of the behavior, what's the duration of it, or how long is it lasting, and how often is it happening on a frequency. So it's frequency, intensity, and duration. Mm-hmm. So with ADHD, all three of those things are more intense when someone's on electronics. Oh, okay. okay. And is there like any comorbidity with other disorders when it comes to ADHD that make it hard for people to know if they're experiencing ADHD symptoms or something else or? Absolutely. So the statistics say that about 60 to 70% of people with ADHD also have another disorder. So there's about 50% overlap between depression and ADHD. There's about a 50% overlap between anxiety and ADHD oppositional defiant disorder, where you are just saying no to say no. Uh, not that you, uh, it's a, little, a good way to explain it is like your boss asks you to do something, you automatically go, no, I'm not doing that. Not for any reason you can come up with just like your instant reaction is no. Um, that's about 50% overlap with ADHD. Although that can also be correlated with people with ADHD tend to have a strong sense of justice. So if they feel like they've been wronged or someone else has been wronged, they will fight for that person. Um, they tend to really fight for the underdog. So, but in extreme cases where it's impacting quality of life, you may qualify for oppositional oppositional defined disorder. Uh, you also have an overlap uh, with autism spectrum disorder about 10% of the time. Uh, social phobia, social anxiety disorder tends to be about 30 to 40% of the time. Now, one thing we want to look at is that sometimes you're born with the genetics for these disorders at the same time you're born with the genetics for ADHD, right? So you may have primary anxiety, primary depression, primary ADHD. But if you have ADHD and you've lived your life having to work five times as hard as everyone else, only getting half the amount of work done, or being told that you're less than, or why can't you work harder, or you're lazy, or you're stupid, that anxiety can also develop from having ADHD as well. Or you get in trouble at school for speaking out in class, or you get in trouble with your friends for interrupting. So now you overcompensate, and now you monitor yourself while you're doing social activities. So now you may have developed social anxiety. So sometimes anxiety, depression can be secondary to ADHD, and sometimes they're primary, and sometimes they're both. So sometimes you see someone getting treatment for ADHD, and their anxiety and depression improves. Or we see once you get treated for ADHD, what's the existing level of depression, anxiety that's already present so we can treat that as well. I saw that just got really technical. I'm sorry. No, it's good. I'm just like, no, this is what we want. So many questions. Yeah, I know. This is this is why you're like one of our favorite I mean, I guys. Really like, I have a math LD and I can't add numbers in my head, but I can remember percentages. So I have no oh, idea how that works. Fascinating. Well, that's another thing. So, so learning disabilities occur with ADHD 50% of the time. So that's math learning disabilities, reading, writing disabilities. Those all occur half the time when you have ADHD. And you can have more than one of those things. You can have like a LD and you can have depression and anxiety and ADHD all at the same time. Our listeners are sitting here right now. Maybe some people are having uh, 
an experience of like, oh shit, maybe I have this or I, I kind of want to know if I do. Is there a website or is there like uh, any sort of online quiz that people can take that would mm-hmm. let them know that maybe there's something going on that they should talk to somebody about? Sure. Well, there's my website, stephaniesarkis.com. So S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-S-A-R-K-I-S. I have to think about whether I spelled that. You're right. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and there are uh, resources on there that you can uh, look and see, do I possibly have ADHD? There's interviews. There's there are also my books on ADHD. And then also there's the National Organization for ADHD, CHADD, C-H-A-D-D dot org. They have a, a wealth of information that's all been vetted or reviewed by professionals. Because one of the things about ADHD is you want to make sure you're getting information that that has been reviewed by clinicians, that it's accurate, valid information. So chad.org, right. C-H-A-D-D.org. That's the big, actually, it's an international organization at this point that specializes in ADHD. Okay. Nice. Oh, great that's a know. great resource. Um, so... You have like with your work on gaslighting and then ADHD is, did one inspire the other? How did, or do they overlap in any way? Like, how did you move from one to the other? They do. So great question. So what I found is that people with ADHD tend to be prone to relationships with narcissists or uh, sociopaths. So when you have ADHD, you tend to go through um, uh, criticism, feeling less than, And you tend to have some self-esteem issues. And also, again, you know, if you have ADHD, you're more likely to have a history of childhood adversity. So when you meet somebody that love bombs you in the beginning and tells you how wonderful you are, it's all the things that some of the ADHD may not have heard before, or they are seeking approval because they've had issues with, with relationships or peers. And so someone telling someone all that stuff is really appealing. It's appealing to anybody, but especially for someone with ADHD because they feel like they belong. So they're more likely to get sucked into this type of relationship. And also, again, because of self-esteem and and family of origin stuff, uh, you're more likely to kind of maybe accept the relationship as, you know, this is how relationships are supposed to go. Or there's a deep-seated feeling of, I'm not good enough, and so you're more likely to stay with that relationship because here's someone telling you, hey, I can fix you, or this is how you should be, or what you're doing is wrong, and you've already been told that so many times, it's, it's you're more likely to stay in that relationship. And also, the gaslighting relationships, like we talked about before, are they're very slowly ramping up into abuse. So you, you may be so overwhelmed with day-to-day life with ADHD that it's it's real, it's even more difficult to discern when someone's behavior is starting to change. And we talked about the love bombing, the idealizing, then the devaluing, and then the discard. So the devaluing, again, is really slow. And for people with ADHD, they may have been criticized so much that this feels kind of normal to them. So I did start seeing more people with ADHD reporting to me issues with emotional abuse, verbal abuse, and around 2016, you know, we started hearing more and more about gaslighting. So it became a, a more present term in the public. So I had people actually telling me, you know, I think I'm being gaslit or I think this person is gaslighting me or I think I'm in a gaslighting relationship. And so it became more and more apparent to me that anytime that you're vulnerable, whether you have ADHD, depression, anxiety, grief, Uh, you're more likely to become prey to someone that's narcissistic or sociopathic. And that turned into an article I wrote for Psychology Today, which went viral, identifying gaslighting. And then that's when the gaslighting book came out. And then there's a book on recovering from toxic relationships that's coming out later this year, uh, because so many people have been impacted, especially people with ADHD, uh, getting into relationships that, that were toxic and really can impact quality of life for a long time to come. So Uh, Really important that we pinpoint that and educate people really early on what an unhealthy versus healthy relationship looks like. Congratulations on the book coming out. Yeah. Thank you. We will have to to, uh, do an episode on it. Yeah. Oh my God. Sounds good. What an interesting connection. It makes so much sense. Yes, I've Mm -hmm. yet I've never heard that before, but it makes so much sense. It really does when you think about it, right? Because like when you're grieving, you're vulnerable. Right. Things are kind of upside down. You feel kind of out of control. So here's someone telling you, "Hey, I think you're great, and you know, I'll, I'll, you know, quote unquote, fix this thing that's going on with you," and it's really alluring. And again, you know, if you have somebody like a covert narcissist where they're really good at covering it up, it's virtually impossible to tell um, if someone is a narcissist if they're covert. So the other thing with ADHD too is that you've been told maybe to not trust your intuition. 
because you're having issues just doing day-to-day stuff. So you're told like, well, there's something wrong with you. You're less than. And so when your intuition tells you, hey, this person might not be great for me, there's the other voice of other people like your parents or teachers or peers going, yeah, you don't really know what's up. You've got, you've had issues before. So you don't pay attention to that. So you're less likely to question whether that person's healthy for you or not, or you kind of push those feelings kind of down. Or sometimes people with ADHD feel well, like, here's somebody tolerating me. I mean, that's the level of self-esteem that gets hit when you have ADHD. I mean, starting from like kindergarten on, even earlier than that. Um, you know, so here's someone that accepts me. I don't know if I'm going to run into this again. So, so this person must be thinking in my best interest. I think also people with ADHD tend to, I'm kind of biased, but I think we have great personalities. We tend to be empathic and look for the best of people. And we tend to look at potential and we really need to start looking at who the person is right then instead of what their potential is. I mean, how many relationships have people gotten into as you look at, well, you know, he or she has potential. Right. So you said you have ADHD. Did you just say that? Right. Oh, Mm -hmm. wow. So that's where this deep seated passion came from with you, I'm assuming with your work or. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I think also uh, just the people, the ADHD, we find each other. So I think that when uh, you have ADHD, like if you go to like the big Chad national conference every year, you find your people like the, the hotel has a stack of room key cards because they know people are going to forget their, their keys. <laughs> and so there's like a long line of people. And then you go on the elevator and nobody can remember what floor they're on. And so everybody's like pushing every button and they have no idea where they're, what floor they're supposed to go to. Um, you know, sense of direction is off in a lot of people with ADHD. So, you know, like everybody's like going the wrong direction, even though you tell them like, go this way and that way. So it's like, oh, my people. So, uh, but I think that we're kind of drawn to people that are like us. So uh, I think that there's, I'm, pro- I'm surrounded by a lot of ADHD people. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I think that when you specialize in it too, I think there's an understanding of it. Um, there are people that don't have ADHD. They're great ADHD clinicians. Um, but I think when you've kind of walked the walk, I think it lends an, another level of understanding to it, um, that it can be incredibly frustrating. And that, and it also gets into like treatments too. So there are treatments available. So there's non-medication treatments and medication treatments. The most effective treatment by far out of any of them is stimulant medication. And stimulants have been around the U.S. since like the 1930s. So uh, they have had longitudinal studies, which means years of looking at how the medications impact people. What they found is if you take stimulant medication, your risk rate for substance abuse drops back down to that of a control group, meaning that if you take stimulant medication, your risk rate almost drops down to zero. So again, when you're trying to replace missing brain chemicals. When you have ADHD, you're low in dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. You're going to find ways to boost those, whether it's through high-risk behavior or you know, regulated medication. So the most effective treatment is stimulant medication. Those are things like Concerta, Vyvanse, Adderall. Then you have the non-stimulant medications, things like uh, like Stratera. Those have been found in head-to-head studies and not be as effective as stimulants but can still have some efficacy. So then there's the non-stimulant treatment. So again, most, most effective treatment is stimulant medication. The non-medication treatments are things like exercise. Regular exercise can increase your executive function performance and increase dopamine as little as 15 minutes after starting to exercise. So exercise daily is important. Uh, also mindfulness practice, that can be something as simple as saying, you know, name three things you can see, three things you can feel, and three things you can hear. And when you do that, you're kind of centering yourself and you're getting yourself back into the present. So that's named three things you can see, three things you can feel, three things you can hear. So that's the mindfulness practice. So mindfulness is helpful. Also omega-369. So that's like what we commonly see as fish oil. And that helps neurons communicate more effectively as little as four weeks after you start taking them. But I always tell people, make sure you check with your prescriber first before you start taking those. Uh, also cognitive behavioral therapy has been found to be very helpful because when you have ADHD, you tend to have, um, some kind of defeating self-talk, like I'm never going to get this done, or I'm not very bright. 
So in CBT, part of what you do is you kind of confront those kind of recordings in your head and replace them with more powerful things. Because what we tell ourselves becomes medicine for our brains, right? So Mm. when you tell yourself negative things, you tend to uh, release more cortisol, stress-producing hormone. Or when you encounter more stressful events, you have cortisol going to your system. When you tell yourself positive things, you tend to get more dopamine, norepinephrine into your system. So what you tell yourself really matters. So that's CBT. So also uh, accommodations. So if you are in college getting accommodations like uh, getting priority registrations, you get the smaller class sizes or class in the afternoon rather than the morning because in ADHD, sometimes your brain's not fully awake in the morning. Uh, You can also get workplace accommodations. Now that's tricky because you can do informal accommodations like wearing noise canceling earbuds and stuff when you're working. So because other noises bother you. Um, And you can try doing those on your own. But if you want to get formal accommodations, you have to disclose ADHD to your employer. So I always recommend just talking to an attorney about that before you go ahead with that to figure out what the benefits and drawbacks are. So that's exercise, mindfulness practice, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, omega-369, and accommodations. So those are the most effective non-medications. But again, the most effective treatment by far is stimulant medication. Okay. So much good information. I have yeah. a few more questions. Kels, where are you at? Sure. <laughs> go, go ahead, Dal. Go ahead. Okay. So I would love to keep to keep this going from last mm-hmm. episode, but are there any TV characters that you think have ADHD? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's so many. I was, um, you know, what's so funny. Oh, fuck. Well, I'm interrupting now. I'm like, oh God, do I have ADHD? <laughs> I just, I just, it's funny that you said that, Del, because I had this in my mind as we started talking about it, um, that Mark Zuckerberg in Social Network, that character to me was very ADHD. Oh, oh that's interesting. Cause I don't know if, I don't know if he has ADHD and I've actually never seen Social Network. I really should. Um, oh, it's I'm such a great to movie. Think of, yeah, yeah, and I love I love that Trent Reznor did the soundtrack. I'm a Nine Inch Nails fan, so oh, um, yes, yeah. So uh, I'm trying to, you know, I had all these ideas of, and now I can't think of any. But I will mention though, the, the one of the first mentions of an ADHD character in literature uh, was a character called Fidgety Philip, and it, this book was written by a pediatrician. And if you read this, it's very clear. And this is written around like the beginning of the 20th century maybe late 18th century, late 19th century. It's this kid that is like, you know, tipping back in his chair at dinner and he falls over or um, he's, you know, just goofing off, not paying attention. Here's like in the early 1900s before we even had like this diagnosis present. I mean, ADHD has been around a long time. Yeah. Um, there's also, and a lot of, there are German fairy tales are really scary. I don't know what that's about, but <laughs> yep. there's one where this kid's like goofing off and like falls in the canal and gets shredded and fed to geese. Jesus. And there's another one where they're <laughs> it's like really horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's one where the, like the kids playing with matches, and, like burns his whole house down, you know, or, you know, like it's like all these calamities that happen. And the kids like very clearly like ADHD. And these are, these are German fairy tales. Oh Can't remember God. the name of them, but, um, but there's all sorts of references in, in early literature to people with ADHD symptoms. And I think the furthest back is there's a play from like the 1500s by Moliere. And there's a character in the play that's very clearly ADHD by today's standards. I mean, if you've done family research, if you're able to have data going back generations, you can usually trace ADHD through previous generations, like way far back if you have that documentation, which which not many families do, but you can clearly see something. Like I have a guy in my family that did the Paul Revere thing before it was cool. And he was telling everybody the British were coming and he got in trouble and he was um, he was tried by the king for treason. And he's in court. And they actually t- court transcripts where they talk about how he was interrupting the judge oh and he God. was um, and he was speaking out of turn. And they described him as frank to the point of brashness, which is a really good way to describe you know, ADHD <laughs> and interrupting people. And that was in the 1600s. So, wow. And he eventually, so, and, but everybody in the town really liked him. So they were like, Hey, you know, don't kill this guy. Cause he was supposed to be hung, drawn and quartered, which doesn't sound very pleasant. So the people in town were like, Hey, you know, this guy's like kind of hyperactive and stuff, but you know, he's really helpful in the community and he helps us, you know, build our barns and he helps us with this stuff and that stuff. So, you know, don't kill him. So they were like, okay, we'll just put him in the tower of London. And I'm not sure what happened to the tower of London, but I'm assuming he got so bored. He probably drove them crazy because then he was shipped back to the U S I mean, I don't know how many people got out of the tower of London were actually sent back to the U S but they're like, go back. And he lived out the rest of his life in the U.S. So, yeah, that's one of my ADHD ancestors. 
So wow. you can see like kind of way back in history. Yeah. And then wow. there was another person I'm related to like way back when that she was whipped at a post for fornication, um, you know, high risk sexual behavior. So yeah, um, that, that was pretty wild. <laughs> so, and then there was this cry that her siblings all got into trouble for different things. And yeah. So um, you can see like way back in, in history that there, are, you know, you can see people through time. Everybody so in some check of the your great ancestral people, documents. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think usually have that, like that kind of detail. Yeah. Um, but uh, you can see people like grandparents, great grandparents. That you know, I've worked with families where the person, um, like the great grandparent, had an early death because they weren't following instructions and they were working in a uh, in a factory. Um, or they didn't they didn't pay attention to uh, do not enter sign and fell down elevator shaft and died. So I've seen people mm-hmm. like it, that. Yeah, you know, they're, they're usually early deaths somewhere in the family if they had ADHD, which is untreated. Because you know, way back then, you know, back a couple of generations, we didn't have the treatments we have today. Right. So you will see stuff like people not working their potential or accidental deaths uh, in families a couple of generations back. Wow. Oh my God. I feel like so many people tuning in right now are having a lot of aha moments on this episode. I did, they're, just, <laughs> they're like, I had someone try for treason too in my family. <laughs> right. I, I knew somebody who was in the tower. What are the chances? We're related. <laughs> um, I also heard that a lot of entrepreneurs tend to have ADHD or choose the mm-hmm. entrepreneurial path. Why? Why is that? So part of that is, is that there are these unwritten rules, the workplace. So there's the employee manual you get, and then there's the real rules. So the employee manual goes, you know, go to this person if you need this thing, but the unwritten rules say, don't do that. Go to their administrative assistant or, you know, ask this person instead. And when you have ADHD, it's hard to keep track of all those unwritten rules because you have to pay attention to that stuff. And if you have untreated ADHD, you're just trying to, you know, keep your head above water and just getting through the day. So the unwritten rules can kind of really trip you up. Also, the entrepreneurial stuff, again, you can make your own rules and you also can do more of what you want to do because when you're working in a nine to five desk job, that can be torment to a lot of people with ADHD. You need some variation in your day. You need to do something that you're really passionate about in order to keep your interest going. So a lot of entrepreneurs find that they get a sense of satisfaction or um, self-efficacy from being able to do their own thing and create their own rules. But sometimes they need non-ADHD people to follow through on stuff. Like I can't tell you the amount of people I've worked with that have ADHD have invented really amazing things, but getting all that detailed paperwork together and getting that whole process rolling, someone else in the meantime has invented this thing and made millions while they already invented the thing, you know, like five years, um, 10 years prior. Right. So sometimes we need people without ADHD to help us carry through on stuff. So usually you need some support staff Uh, with you when you're going to business for yourself to kind of keep you on track and to do the detailed paperwork. Yeah. We're great idea people. It's just sometimes we need someone to do the details. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, It's funny to me in the podcasting world because Adele, I think you and I've talked about this before that I think, especially um, if you're a female going into a male dominated podcast, or even just if you're in a comedy club and you're sitting talking with male comics, there's kind of this um, thing that's told to women of, you got to get in there. You got to, you know, almost like Mm -hmm. getting into a double dutch or something. Like if you Mm -hmm. want your voice to be heard on the podcast or whatever, and it's a group of men talking, you're going to have to maybe interrupt somebody to just be able Mm -hmm. to say something, right? right? Because- Um, and we've gotten really nice things said to us over the years of, it's so nice that you guys don't interrupt each other. And that mm-hmm. there's so many other male dominated podcasts that where it's just like constantly talking over one another. Um, but I think <laughs> it's just funny because that's obviously this bad thing of ADHD, but, um, it's something that's almost encouraged in certain careers mm-hmm. where it's like, if you want mm-hmm. to have your voice heard, you have to get in there somehow. Right. And that's also ties into the issue of girls not being diagnosed until later or mm-hmm. women not being diagnosed till in their twenties, uh, because you have that thing of, you know, it's less accepted in society for women to interrupt or speak out. Um, and that's why we're told, you know, you have to do that stuff to, to be heard. So right. when you have that issue of, you know, you're told in class that, you know, we don't speak out. And again, it's not until you get into college where you realize that, 
when you come up with your own structured schedule, it's really hard to do that. And it's really hard to show up for class on time and nobody's telling you, you know, not to go or to show up. Um, that's where it gets diagnosed. So you can see kind of where that leads into the idea that we tend to be a little quieter in places, right? Yeah. So it's not caught as, as early as it is in boys and men. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if a, if a parent right now is tuning in and they have a young daughter who has ADHD, what could they look for to ensure that her diagnosis doesn't like slip through the cracks or that she's not overlooked like so many young girls with this are? Is your child working with their potential? Do you have a family history? And sometimes families don't like talking about this stuff, like anything to do with mental health. And that's, that's pretty common. Um, But it's, it's, if you frame it as, Hey, I need to know this stuff because it helps me help my kid. And that this isn't a value judgment. I just need to know anybody in the family that had a history of depression or anxiety or difficulty working their potential. Anybody drop out of high school or college anyone that that was underemployed they didn't just work to their potential there's something that they there was a missing puzzle piece there anybody in the family was like that Um, because we have first degree relatives those are parents siblings kids secondary relatives aunts uncles grandparents cousins if you're first uh first generation basically our first degree relatives have something you're much more likely to have it second degree relative maybe not as much but it's still pretty prevalent so you need to know family history and if your kid you feel is not working to what they should be at um, based on their IQ and their ability is something to look at. And maybe it might not be ADHD, maybe learning disability, but it's worth getting an assessment and evaluation and going to a mental health professional and getting assessed to see if that might be an issue. Because we want to catch this early. The earlier we catch it, the less issues there are with self-esteem, the earlier you can get treatment. And studies have found that the earlier you get treatment for ADHD, the better outcome you have in life. You tend to get better grades. You may get a better college. You may get a job that you like. Um, there again, there's a real loss of potential if this is not caught early enough. But also, if you have ADHD and you're in in your 40s, 50s, 60s, that doesn't mean it's too late. I mean, the oldest person I've diagnosed with ADHD was in their 80s. They had a lifetime of not working with their potential, uh, multiple relationships where they got bored, or um, infidelity can be an issue for ADHD because of novelty seeking behavior. So uh, losing jobs because they couldn't keep up with the demand of what the job asked them to do in multi-step directions. And finally, at 80, that missing puzzle piece was put into place. So it's never too late to get diagnosed. And there is a phenomenon that once you get diagnosed, you may have feelings of my ADHD seems worse, or I'm, I'm having anger about not being diagnosed early. And that's all very normal. It's normal to go through a grieving process of why wasn't I diagnosed earlier? And once you find out you have it, you may notice it's worse because you're paying more attention to it. Or you realize, oh, the reason why I have to go back home and get something is might be the ADHD. So right. you start noticing it more and more in different areas of life. But again, there are treatments available. So there's a lot of hope for people that have ADHD. Can you share briefly, briefly, like when somebody with ADHD is experiencing hyper-focus, what does that Mm -hmm. feel like to them? Uh, I think it's a little bit different for everyone, but what I'll just say that like when when you, the algorithm tells me what, like if I'm, my Adderall is not on board, like right now it's on board, but if it's, if it's not on board, um, what will happen with me is I'll watch a video and it'll be like, like three hours has gone by. And also I realize I'm like totally hungry and I haven't eaten um, because I'll be like, oh, here's a video of dogs wearing tutus and doing flips. And here's, you know, like you start seeing more and more videos. So you get kind of in this, this tunnel vision where nothing else seems to occur. Um, like there could be, um, you know, the dog could be barking or, you know, someone could be calling my name and I don't hear it. So that's what hyper-focus looks like. It's like you're in the zone. So everybody kind of gets in the zone when they're doing something they enjoy. And it's like time flies by. It's like times a hundred to people with ADHD. Mm -hmm. Like you don't hear anything else going on. And so that's kind of what it's like. It's it's like um, you don't know where those hours went. It feels like it was about five minutes. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think that's why things like um, TikTok or like you said, the YouTube algorithm can mm-hmm. confuse people into feeling like, God, do I have something like this? When I, mm-hmm. again, and I, I don't know, but I also think technology is becoming so advanced that it's like, mm-hmm. even if you don't maybe have ADHD, you're having a really hard time breaking away from this thing that right. is designed to flood you with chemicals that make you right. feel good. And TikTok is scary good at giving you exactly what you want. Mm-hmm. 
over and over snippets? and over. Right. It's, right. I mean, it is the perfect candy that um, mm. I think it's easy for anybody to fall susceptible to right. <laughs> scrolling and then being like, Jesus, you know, this is hard right. to break away from. Yeah. It's why I don't have it on my phone um, because TikTok is especially luring for ADHD. It's quick snippets. Yeah. It's stuff you want to see. Now there's a lot of great ADHD content on there, which has been very right. helpful to a lot of people, but you know, you can have the, the parameters on your phone that tell you, you know, okay, your time's almost up. And then you just hit dismiss, you know? So, so those kind of <laughs> things that. that you tell you, <laughs> yeah, like dismiss. I don't, I don't even know that. Uh, yeah. So again, people will will go on their phones and they will be looking at like the 15, 16, 17 video and not realize how much time they've been spending. So sometimes it helps to have a visual timer or somebody that that you know tells you, hey, wait a second, you've been doing that for like an hour um, and you need someone to kind of jolt you out of it. Um, there are also website blockers that will um, tell you, hey, uh, this website, you told me not to let you on there between the hours of nine to five. And people will jump out of and like kind of break out of that trance. It is kind of like a trance and they'll realize how much time they've spent. So it's doing that stuff in small doses. And sometimes it's better to just not do it um, and to stay away from it. However, you know, there's also an issue of getting to sleep. So studies have found that if you look at backlit devices a couple hours before bed, so that's tablets, phones, TVs, laptops, you inhibit the release of a, a hormone called um, serotonin or not serotonin, uh, mel melatonin into your system. And melatonin is kind of like your sleeping hormone. It gets you ready to go to bed. Now, when you have ADHD, you already have suppressed melatonin release. So you already have issues with your brain releasing melatonin to help you get to sleep. So people with ADHD tend to have initial insomnia or delayed sleep onset, which means you're laying there and you're like, my brain's still going. It's like a hamster wheel. I can't get to sleep because your brain doesn't stop being ADHD at night, right? So mm -hmm. when you look at backlit devices and combine that with ADHD, logic tells you you're going to have even more of a difficulty going to bed. So the ideal is to shuffle like tracks two hours before bed. But sometimes when I recommend that to people, they ask me like, a, a, they look at me like I've asked them to remove their head, you know, <laughs> like it's such a foreign concept. So I'm like, well, yeah. try it, you know, 15 minutes before bed, just shut off your electronics. Like yeah. everybody in the house shuts them off because you can hear other people's stuff that's on, right? And it gets your brain going, oh, there's other things going on. So try it for 15 minutes, then work your way up to a half hour, an hour. And people will usually tell me within about four days that they are able to sleep better because they've turned off their electronic devices before bed. Mm -hmm. So, and also if you, if you have a teenager at home, you know, teenagers are texting each other like at three in the morning and you, know, you already have issues with sleep with ADHD. Like we have issues with initial insomnia. We wake up in the middle of the night, we get up too early in the morning and if you're texting at like three, four in the morning, you're, you're causing even more issues with sleep deprivation. I mean, sleep issues happen like 90% of the time on people with ADHD. Yeah. So really yeah. important that we practice good sleep habits and that's for everybody, but I think especially ADHD. Yeah. What does, uh, let's say, you know, somebody with ADHD is in a healthy relationship, not a narcissistic mm -hmm. one or experiencing mm -hmm. that, but what might the partner be experiencing who doesn't have ADHD? Um, you know, question. Uh, yeah. How does that mm -hmm. work? Well, usually there's a higher level of relationship dissatisfaction. Um, and that's from the person with ADHD and the person without ADHD. Um, a friend of mine, Ari Tuckman, Dr. Ari Tuckman, wrote a really good book. He did a study on couples where one person has ADHD and one person doesn't. A uh, really good book. It's called ADHD After Dark. And he would be a great guest on your on your show. Ooh, um, right talking there. about, <laughs> yes, Tuckman, Ari Tuckman. So um, that, it yeah. showed that, that, you know, that dissatisfaction is on kind of both sides of the equation. And also he found that one of the biggest indicators of how much sex you get in a relationship is how many chores you do. So that's where so everybody of that again, how much, <laughs> so, so sure. So how much sex you get in a relationship is highly correlated with, and sexual satisfaction is correlated with how many chores you do at home, <laughs> which makes sense. Right. So okay. if you were, and that doesn't mean like you're seeing right sex. It's, it, <laughs> look, <laughs> so it's more like, it's more like if you um, are putting forth the effort in your relationship, because relationships take effort. They shouldn't take work, but they should take effort. Um, that you're you're fulfilling your kind of role or and roles are wrong word, but if you're doing the stuff that you need to do to keep up, you know, the relationship and the stuff that goes along with that, like day to day stuff, the unromantic stuff, 
you're more likely to be able to connect with your partner. Your partner is going to feel more appreciated. So when you have ADHD, sometimes um, if your partner doesn't have it, sometimes the behavior is taken personally when it's just that your brain can't do stuff. So when you're told to go to the grocery store and get eggs and milk and you come back with you know eight other things that weren't on the list, which is very common, the person that doesn't have ADHD may say, well, hey, if you, had, you know liked me more or loved me more, you would have paid attention to what I needed. And the ADHD person is like, what are you talking about? I just forgot those things. So I, I think it's really beneficial to look at the fact that it's not the ADHD brain doesn't want to do stuff. It can't. And that's also where treatment's really important, that if you have treatment that works for you, you know, if, if medication's working the way it's supposed to, you still feel like, like you have the same personality, same sense of humor, but you're able to follow through on day-to-day -day living stuff. Yeah, you know, People with ADHD do really well in crisis, but it's the day-to-day -day living, the loading, unloading, the dishwasher that really wears us out. So stuff like that, or if you're able to afford it, that you get, you know, a, a personal assistant, or you get someone in the home to help you with that stuff. So you aren't arguing over the dishwasher or how the dishes are put in the dishwasher. I mean, I, I think the you know, dishwasher issue should be in our diagnostic manual as part of ADHD because you see so many couples um, arguing about whether the dishes are clean enough going in the dishwasher, which way they should be put in, um, leaving dishes in the sink. So uh, that stuff, you know, that, that causes resentment in relationships. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So again, the, the book's ADHD after dark by Ari Tuckman. He's got a great podcast too. So, um, but you do see a lot of issues with relationship dissatisfaction and, and marriage counseling and couples counseling can be one of the, one of the best things to do. If the person uh, that you're working with is knowledgeable about ADHD and how it impacts relationships, that's really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so, yeah, I think that if you tend to it and you make sure that you're aware of different issues that can arise, I think it can help a healthy relationship become even healthier. Yeah, man. Oh, good. Oh You're my gosh. <laughs> I left you guys speechless. Oh my God. Oh. It's so good. <laughs> really, like you could just be on the show every week and I'd have 5,000 more questions to ask you <laughs> in the next episode. <laughs> Thank you so much again. Can you plug where people can find you? Like plug your website again sure. so people can go kind of check out those resources. Sure. It's stephaniesarkis.com. So S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-S-A-R-K-I-S. And uh, books are gaslighting. There's also 10 simple solutions to adult ADD. Um, several, I think the, uh, the toxic relationship book is coming out in the years of my eighth book, I think, or ninth. Um, I also have a workbook for clinicians on executive function disorders. Uh, and I have a, a podcast called Talking Brains, talk about ADHD and other related stuff. Um, and uh, I guess I'm all over social media too. So, uh, but it's yeah. stephaniesarkis.com. And thank you again for having me on. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Oh, thank you so much. Just yeah. dropping all your knowledge bombs. It's amazing. <laughs> so it's good. a lot. It's a lot of stuff. So, so I would say to so someone good. with ADHD, if you're feeling overwhelmed, um, there is hope. And sometimes you just kind of got to take a step back and kind of process all the stuff because there is a lot of information out there. Yeah. But one of the first things to do is make an appointment with a mental health professional who specializes in ADHD to see what treatment options are available. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. And we would truly love to have you back on when your book comes out to promote it. And absolutely a topic that our listeners would always be interested in is recovering after toxic relationships. I'd oh, be happy to. Yes, indeed. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sarkis. Have a lovely You're day. You're welcome. <laughs> you too. Bye. 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 Oh my gosh. Stephanie is the fucking best. I feel like <laughs> I feel I like we're on a her. first name basis now. Yeah. And that's very exciting. I just She's love her. So good. I mean, it's these episodes are jam-packed. Jam-packed. Like you need a notebook, you need to listen to it several times because she gives you so much good shit in such a short amount of time. It's yeah. like yeah, some of my favorite episodes. Well, and I can't wait to have her back on to talk about, you know, the uh, aftermath of being in a toxic relationship. I just think that's such an important mm -hmm. topic. <laughs> you yes, know? absolutely. Yeah. So many good things in this episode. I just did not know. I really did yeah. not know much about ADHD. Me neither. And it's so, it's, it's just so casually talked about the way that people talk about, oh, I have anxiety. Oh, I'm depressed. You know, there's such a difference between clinical depression and feeling depressed, right? Yeah. Or like feeling anxious in a situation versus being clinically anxious. And I think that's the same thing with ADD. 
Yeah, it kind of gets thrown around like, oh, well, that's just my OCD or my OCD tendencies. I've got to keep my pen straight on my desk. You know, it does get thrown out, thrown around a lot. And yeah. so many layers to it that I really didn't didn't know or understand. And I feel like I learned yeah. so much from this episode. We have an iTunes review. <laughs> <laughs> we do have an iTunes <laughs> review. Do you want to read it, Del? Sure. This is from Katie Hepburn. It says, thanks for the quotes. I appreciate the quotes y'all share. They've saved my mindset on many occasions. I thought I'd share one I appreciate. It's not a quote by anyone, but a thought I have every morning that helps motivate me. Be in a loving long distance relationship with your future self. Oh, I love that. I love this. That is so fucking good. I read this on iTunes before today's episode and was just like, this is incredible. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is a hell of a quotable. Um, do things today that your future self will thank you for. Small things like fold that laundry, delete that toxic phone number, drink more water. It all adds up and you'll be grateful when you look back and see your greatest supporter was yourself all along. Oh my God. Yes. Confetti! Give the confetti! <laughs> Katie! We need a horn or something. That, that is so good. That, I'm, that's really going to stick with me. You know when, you're just, yeah. when you read something that's really, it's, it's in here forever now? Yeah. That, that's so excellent. And think, I'm so glad we have a quotable because I totally forgot to ask Dr. Sarkis what her favorite or least favorite right. quote was for this episode because I think we're just so excited to get right into her topic. Yeah. Like I completely... It completely lost me. We'll yeah. have to ask the next time she's on. Wow. That's, yeah, maybe we will start um, another episode soon just with that again as like an official quotable. Yes. That's Do you have any um, segments, Kels, or anything you want to plug? Just an update that I am now cast free. I am like oh, my yes. wrist is my wrist is pretty much mostly healed. There's still certain little things I can't um, do fully, but I'm, I'm on the mend. I'm getting better. So yep. That's that a is update. good. Um, yep. I have a good shit that I feel like you would very much approve of. So I don't know if you know this, but I've been using the same straightener since I was 18. That's also like a combination, like a curler. So I'm 31 for anybody tuning in. So. <laughs> How is that even still working? <laughs> to, the po- well, to the point where it, the thing is like stained like a light brown color because it's been used so much. And I'm sure like, Ugh. you know, Ugh. hair, oil and stuff. It's gross. So I, I ended up getting, um, and I haven't used it yet, but I got one of those like wand situations where you just pull, you put your hair on a stick, mm-hmm. like a fire stick. Anyway, so that, <laughs> but oh my God, looking into that was like so horrifying. Just all the different options. Like some look like, you know, anal beads on a stick and some come with gloves that you're going, you're like you're going to a fucking coal mine or something. Like how much <laughs> machinery does my hair need? And how many pieces of protective equipment? <laughs> Yeah, man. And accessories. I'm like, this is, it It was so overwhelming, dude. And so I just had to like pick one because it was starting to freak me out. And I just picked one and it's got, it's like a kit with a few different sizes and options and mm-hmm. it has a freaking glove. And I'm, I haven't opened it yet because I'm a little scared, but that's my update on wow. uh, my Proud beauty regimen. Yeah. Proud of you. Got a hair wand. That was a, that was a necessary upgrade. If it's brown and it's from 18. Like you're, yeah, I was time. 18. I got it at a kiosk at the mall and it's a zebra print. That was my old one. My new one is purple. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It was time to go. It was time to go. <laughs> it was time slowly, but surely everybody upgrading mm-hmm. my uh, beauty essentials. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah um, that's all, I got. all right. Well, <laughs> Again, I'll be in DC this weekend. I'm so excited to see you guys. Uh, I'll be in San Francisco a couple weeks after that. Uh, KelseyCook.com for tour dates. And yeah. Yeah. DelaneyFisher.com for cool. my shit. <laughs> That's it. All right, guys. All right. Yeah, we we'll you. talk to you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Self Helpless Podcast. You can find our Patreon community, merch, and our individual work at selfhelplesspodcast.com. We'd be thrilled if you shared this episode with a friend or feel free to post it on Instagram and tag at selfhelplesspodcast so we can repost you and say thank you. 